Hello, welcome to my recording of the great, great audiobook of Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls. If you like this book and you need stuff to do with the book, teachers, head on over to my Teacher Pay Teacher store. It's just SWN, uh, the S, the letter WN, uh, and you'll find a whole lot of stuff over there like Google Forms and questions that go along with this book as well. So enjoy the story. Chapter 1. When I left my office that beautiful spring day, I had no idea what was in store for me. To begin with, everything was too perfect for anything unusual to happen. It was one of those days when a man feels good. Feels like speaking to his neighbor. He's glad to live in a country like ours and proud of his government. You know what I mean. One of those rare days when everything is right and nothing is wrong. I was walking along whistling when I heard the dog fight. At first I paid no attention to it. After all, it wasn't anything to get excited about, just another dog fight in a residential section. As the sound of the fight grew nearer, I could tell there were quite a few dogs mixed up in it. They boiled out of an alley, turned, and headed straight toward me. Not wanting to get bitten or run over, I moved over to the edge of the sidewalk. I could see that all the dogs were fighting one. About 25 feet from me, they caught him, and down he went. I felt sorry for the unfortunate one. I knew if something wasn't done quickly, the sanitation department would have to pick up the dead dog. I was trying to make up my mind to help when I got a surprise. Up out of that snarling, growling, slashing mass reared an old red bone hound. For a second, I saw him. I caught my breath. I couldn't believe what I had seen. Twisting and slashing, he fought his way through the pack and backed up under the low branches of the hedge. Growling and snarling, they formed a half-moon circle around him. A big bird dog, bolder than the others, darted in. The hedge shook as he tangled with the hound. He came out so fast he fell over backwards. I saw that his re right ear was split wide open. It was too much for him and he took off down the street, squalling like a scalded cat. The big ugly cur tried his luck. <clears throat> he didn't get off so easy. He came out with his left shoulder laid open to the bone. He sat down on his rear and let the world know that he had been hurt. By this time, my fighting blood was boiling. It's hard for a man to stand and watch an old hound fight against such odds, especially if that man has memories in his heart like I had in mine. I had seen the time when an old hound like that had given his life so that I might live. Taking off my coat, I waded in. My yelling and scolding didn't have much effect, but the swinging coat did. The dog scattered and left. Down on my knees, I peered back under the hedge. The hound was still mad. He growled at me and showed his teeth. I knew it wasn't his nature to fight a man. In a soft voice, I started talking to him. Come on, boy, I said. It's all right. I'm your friend. Come on now. Fighting fire slowly left his eyes. He bowed his head and his long red tail started thumping the ground. I kept coaxing. On his stomach an inch at a time he came to me and laid his head in my hand. I almost cried at what I saw. His coat was dirty and mud caked. His skin was stretched drum tight over his bony frame. The knotty joints of his hips and shoulders stood out a good three inches from his body. I could tell he was starved. I couldn't figure it out. He didn't belong in town. He was far out of place with the boxers, poodles, bird dogs, and other breeds of the town dogs. He belonged in the country. He was a hunting dog. I raised one of his paws. They were there I read the story. The pads were worn down slick as the rind of an apple. I knew he had come a long way, and no doubt had a long way to go. Around his neck was a crude collar. On closer inspection, I saw it had been made from a piece of check line leather. Two holes had been punched in each end, and the ends were laced together with bailing wire. As I turned the collar in my finger, I saw something else. There, scratched deep in the tough leather, was the name Buddy. I guessed that the crude, scribbly letters had been probably written by a little boy. It's strange indeed how memories can lie dormant in a man's mind for so many years. 
yet those memories can be awakened and brought forth fresh and new just by something you've seen or something you've heard or the sight of an old familiar face. What I saw in the warm gray eyes of the friendly old hound brought back wonderful memories. To show my gratitude, I took hold of his collar and said, Come on, boy, let's go home and get something to eat. He seemed to understand that he had found a friend, and he came willingly. I gave him a bath and rubbed all the soreness from his muscles. He drank quarts of warm milk and ate all the meat I had in the house. I hurried down to the store and I bought more. He ate until he was satisfied. He slept all that night and most of the next day. Late in the afternoon, he grew wet, restless. I told him I understood, and as soon as it was dark, he could be on his way. I figured he had a much better chance if he left town at night. That evening, a little after sundown, I opened the back gate. He walked out, stopped, turned around, and looked at me. He thanked me by wagging his tail. With tears in my eyes, I said, You're more than welcome, old fellow. In fact, you could have stayed here as long as you wanted to. He whined and licked my hand. I was wondering which way he would go. With one final whimper, he turned and headed east. I couldn't help smiling as I watched him trot down the alley. I noticed the way his hindquarters shifted over to the right, never in line with the front, yet always in perfect rhythm. His long ears flopped up and down, keeping time with the jogging motion of his body. Yes, there were all, they were all there, the unmistakable marks of a hunting hound. Where the alley emptied into the street, he stopped and looked back. I waved my hand. As I watched him disappear in the twilight shadows, I whispered these words. Good luck and good hunting. I didn't have to let him go. I could have kept him in my backyard, but to pin up a dog like that is a sin. It would have broken his heart. The will to live would have slowly left his body. I had no idea where he had come from or where he was going. <clears throat> Perhaps it wasn't too far or maybe it was a long, long way. I tried to make myself believe that his home was in the Ozark Mountains somewhere in Missouri or Oklahoma. It wasn't possible, even though it was a long way from the Snake River Valley in Idaho. I figured something drastic must have happened in his life, as it is very unusual for a hound to be traveling all alone. Perhaps he'd been stolen, or maybe he had been sold for some much-needed money. Whatever it was that had interrupted his life, he was trying to straighten it out. He was going home <clears throat> to the master he loved. And with the help of God, he would make it. To him, it made no difference how long the road or how rough or rocky. <clears throat> His old red feet would keep jogging on and on mile after mile. There would be no crying or giving up. And when his feet grew tired and weary, he would curl up on his, in the weeds and rest. Water from the rain puddle or a mountain stream would quench his thirst and cool his hot, dry throat. Food found along the highway or the offerings from a friendly hand would ease the pangs of hunger. Through the rains, the snows, and the desert heat, he would jog along, never looking back. Some morning, he would be found curled up on the front porch. The long journey would be over. He would be alone. He would be home. There would be a lot of tail wagging and a few whimpering cries. His warm, moist tongue would caress the hand of his master. All would be forgiven. Once again, the lights would shine in his dog's world. His heart would be happy. After my friend had disappeared in the darkness, I stood and stared at the empty alley. A strange feeling came over me. At first, I thought I was lonely or sad, but I realized that that wasn't it at all. The feeling was a wonderful one. Although the old hound had no way of knowing it, he had stirred memories and what priceless treasures they were. Memories of my boyhood days, an old KC baking powder can, and two little red hounds. Memories of a wonderful love unselfish devotion and death in its saddest form. As I turned to enter my yard, I started to lock the gate, and then I thought, no, I'll leave it open. He might just come back. I was about halfway to the house when a cool breeze drifted down from the rugged Tetons. It had a bite to it, and goose pimples jumped out of my skin. I stopped at the woodshed and picked up a few, several sticks of wood I didn't turn on any lights on entering the house. The dark, quiet atmosphere was a perfect setting for the mood I was in. I built a fire in the fireplace and pulled up my favorite rocker. 
As I sat there in the silence, the fire grew larger. It crackled and popped. Firelight shadows began to shimmer and dance around the room. The warm, comfortable heat felt good. I struck a match to light my pipe. As I did, two beautiful cups gleamed from the mantel. I held the match up so I could get a better look. There they were, sitting side by side. One was large with long upright handles that stood out like wings on a morning dove. The highly polished surface gleamed and glistened with a golden sheen. The other was smaller and made of silver. It was neat and trim and sparkled like a white star in the heavens. I got up and took them down. There was a story in those cups, a story that went back more than a half a century. As I caressed the smooth surfaces, my mind drifted back through the years, back to my boyhood days. How wonderful the memories were. Piece by piece, the story unfolded. Chapter 2 well, I suppose there's a time in practically every young boy's life when he's affected by that wonderful disease of puppy love. I don't mean the kind of boy uh, has for a pretty little girl that lives down the road. I mean the real kind, the kind that has four small feet and a wiggly tail, and sharp little teeth that can gnaw on a boy's finger. The kind a boy can romp and play with, even eat and sleep with. I was ten years old when I first became infected with this terrible disease. I'm sure no boy in the world had it worse than I did. It's not easy for a young boy to want a dog and not be able to have one. It starts gnawing on his heart. It gets all mixed up in his dreams. It gets worse and worse until finally it becomes almost unbearable. If my dog wanting had been that of an ordinary boy, <clears throat> I'm sure my mother and father would have gotten me a puppy. My wants were different. I didn't want just one dog. I wanted two. Not just any kind of dog. They had to be a special kind and a special breed. I had to have some dogs, so I went to my father and had a talk with him. <clears throat> he scratched his head and thought it over. Well, Billy, he said, I heard that old man Hatfield's collie's going to have pups. I'm sure I can get you one of them for you. You may as well have poured cold water on me. Papa, I said, I don't want an old collie dog. I want hounds, coon hounds, and I want two of them. I could tell by the look on his face that he wanted to help me but couldn't. He said, Billy, those kinds of dogs cost money and that's something we don't have right now. Maybe someday when we can afford it, you can have them, but not right now. I didn't give up. After my talk with Papa, I went to Mama. Well, I fared no better there. Right off, she said I was too young to be hunting with hounds. And besides, a hunter needed a gun and that was one thing I couldn't have. Not until I was 21 anyway. I couldn't understand it. There I was sitting right there in the middle of the finest hunting country in the world. And I didn't even have a dog. Our home was in a beautiful valley far back in the rugged Ozarks. The country was new and sparsely settled. The land we lived on was Cherokee land, allotted to my mother because of the Cherokee blood that flowed in her veins. It lay in a strip from the foothills of the mountains to the banks of the Illinois River in northeastern Oklahoma. The land was rich, black, and fertile. Papa said it would grow hair on a cross-cut saw. He was the first man to stick the cold steel point of a turning plow into the virgin soil. Mama had picked the spot for our log house. It nestled at the edge of the foothills in the mouth of the small canyon, and it's surrounded by a grove of huge red oaks. And behind our house, one could see miles and miles of the mighty Ozarks. In the spring, the aromatic scent of wild flowers, red buds, pawpaws, and dogwoods drifting on the wind currents spread over the valley and around our home. Below our fields, twisting and winding, ran the clear blue waters of the Illinois River. The banks were cool and shady. The rich bottom land near the river was studded with tall sycamores, birches, and box elders. And to a ten-year-old country boy, it was the most beautiful place in the whole wide world. And I took advantage of it all. I roamed the hills and the river bottoms. I knew every game trail and the thick cane breaks and every animal track that was pressed in the mud along the riverbanks. The ones that fascinated me the most were the baby tracks of a river coon. I'd lie for hours examining them. Before leaving, I'd take a switch and sweep them all away. These I called my trail looks. The next day I'd hurry back and sure enough, nine times out of ten, 
There in the clean swept ground I would again find the tracks of a ringtail coon. I knew he had passed over the trail during the night. I could close my eyes and almost see him humped up and waddling along fishing under the banks of this delicate little pause for crawfish and frogs and minnows. I was a hunter from the time I could walk. I caught lizards on the rail fences, rats on the corn crib, and frogs in the little creek that ran through the fields. I was a young Daniel Boone. As the days passed, the dog wanting disease grew worse. I began to see these dogs in my sleep. I went back to my father and mother. It was the same old story. Good hounds cost money and they just didn't have it. My dog wanting became so bad I began to lose weight and my food didn't taste good anymore. Mama noticed this and she had a talk with Papa. You're going to have to just do something, she said. I never saw a boy grieve like that. It's not right. Not right at all. I know, said Papa, and I feel just as badly as you do. But what can I do? You know we don't have that kind of money. Well, I don't care, said Mama. You've got to do something. I just can't stand to see him cry like that. Besides, he's getting to be a problem. I can't get my work done. He follows me around all day begging for hounds. Well, I offered him to get him a dog, said Papa, but he doesn't want just any kind of dog. He wants hounds, and they cost money. Do you know what the Parker boys paid for those two hounds they bought? Seventy-five dollars. If I had that much money, I'd buy another mule. I sure do need one. I had overheard this conversation from another room. At first, it made me feel pretty good. At least I was getting to be a problem. Then I didn't feel so good. I knew my mother and father were poor and didn't have any money. I began to feel sorry for them and myself. After thinking it over, I figured out a way to help. Even though it was a great sacrifice, I told Papa I had decided I didn't want two hounds. One would be enough. I saw the hurt in his eyes. It made me feel like someone was squeezing water out of my heart. Papa set me on his lap and we had a good talk. He told me how hard times were and that it looked like a man couldn't get a fair price for anything he raised. Some of the farmers had quit farming and were cutting railroad ties so that they could feed their families. If things didn't get better, that's what he'd have to do. He said he'd give anything he could to get some good hounds from me. There didn't seem to be any way he could do it right then. And I went off to bed with my heart all torn up in little pieces and cried myself to sleep. The next day, Papa had to go to the store. Late that evening, I saw him coming back. <clears throat> as fast as I could, I ran to meet him, expecting a sack of candy. Instead, he handed me three small steel traps. Well, if Santa Claus himself had come out of those mountains, reindeer and all, I would not have been more pleased. I jumped up and down and cried a whole bucket full of tears. I hugged him and told him what a wonderful papa he was. He showed me how to set them by mashing the spring down with my foot and how to work the trigger. I took them to bed with me that night. The next morning, I started trapping around the barn. <laughs> the first thing I caught was Sammy, our house cat. If this didn't cause a commotion... I didn't intend to catch him. I was trying to catch a rat, but somehow he came nosing around and got in my trap. My sister started bawling and yelling for Mama. She came running, wanting to know what in the world was going on. None of us had to tell her. Sammy told her with his spitting and squalling. He was mad. He couldn't understand what that thing was that was biting his foot, and he was making an awful fuss about it. His tail was as big as a wet corn cob, and every hair on his small body was sticking straight up. He spit and yowled and dared anyone to get close to him. My sisters yelled their full heads off all the time, saying, Poor Sammy, poor Sammy. Mama shushed them and told me to go get the forked stick from under the clothesline. I ran and got it. Mama was the best helper boy ever had. She put the forked end over Sammy's neck and pinned him to the ground. It was bad enough for the trap to be biting his foot, but to have his neck pinned down that way was too much. He threw a fit. I never heard such a racket in all my life. It wasn't long until everything on the place was all spooked up. The chickens started cackling and flew up way up on the hillside. Daisy, our milk cow, all but tore the barn lot up, refused to give any milk that night. And Sloppy Ann, our hog, <laughs> she started running in circles, squealing and grunting. Sammy wiggled and twisted. He yowled and spit, but it didn't do him any good. Mama was good and stout. She held him down tight to the ground. 
I ran in and put my foot on the trap spring, smashed it down, and released his foot. With one loud squall, he scooted under the barn. And after it was all over, Mama said, I don't think you'll have any more trouble with that cat. I think he has learned his lesson. How wrong Mama was. Sammy was one of those nosy kinds of cats. He would lie up on the red oak limbs and watch every move I made. I found some slick little trails out in our garden down under some tall hollyhocks. Thinking they were some game trails and not knowing they were Sammy's favorite hunting trails, I set my traps. Sammy couldn't understand what I was doing out there messing around his hunting territory, so he went to investigate. It wasn't long until I had him limping all on four feet. Every time Papa saw Sammy lying around in the warm sun with his feet wrapped in the turpentine rags, he would laugh until big tears rolled down his cheeks. Mama had another talk with Papa. She said he was going to have to say something to me because if I caught that cat one more time, it would drive her out of her mind. Papa told me to be a little bit more careful where I set my traps. Papa, I said, I don't want to catch Sammy, but he's the craziest cat I ever saw. He sees everything I do, and, and, and just as just go sniffing around. Papa looked over at Sammy. He was lying all sprawled out in the sunshine with all four paws, bandages, and sticking straight up. His long tail was swishing this way and that. You see, Papa? He's watching me right now, just waiting for me to set my traps. Papa walked off toward the barn. I heard him laughing fit to kill. It finally got too much for Sammy. He left home. Oh, he came in once in a while, all long and lean and looking, but never was the same friendly cat anymore. He was nervous and wouldn't let anyone pet him. He would gobble down his milk and then scoot for the timber. Once I decided to make friends with him because I felt bad about catching him in my traps. I reached out my hand to rub his back. He swelled up like a sitting hen. His eyeballs got all green and he growled way down deep. He spat at me and drew back his paw like he was going to knock my head off. I decided I'd better leave him alone. In no time at all, I cleaned out the rats. Then something bad happened. Uh, I caught one of Mama's prize hens. I got one of those young man peach tree switchings over that. Papa told me to go down in the canoe cane breaks back of our fields and trap. <clears throat> this opened up all kinds of new wonders. I caught possums, skunks, rabbits, and squirrels. Papa showed me how to skin my game. In neat little rows, I tacked the hides on the smokehouse wall. I'd stand for hours and admire my magnificent trophies. There was only one thing wrong. I didn't have a big coonskin to add to my collection. I couldn't trap old Mr. Ringtail. He was too smart for me. He'd steal the bait from the trap, spring the triggers, and sometimes even turn them over. Once I found a small stick standing upright in one of my traps, I showed it to Papa. He laughed and said, The stick must have fallen from a tree. It made no difference what Papa said. I was firmly convinced that the smart old coon had deliberately poked that stick in my trap. The traps helped my dog one in considerably, but like a new toy, the newness wore off, and I was right back where I'd started from. Only this time, <clears throat> my worse, much worse. I had been exposed to the feel of wildlife. When I started pestering Mama again, she said, Oh no, not that again. I thought you'd be satisfied with the traps. No, Billy, I don't want to hear any more about hounds. I knew Mama meant what she said. This broke my heart. I decided I'd leave home. I sneaked out a quart jar of peaches, some cold cornbread, and a few onions, and started up the hollow back of our house. I had it all figured out. I'd go way, away, away off to some big town and get a hundred dogs and bring them all back with me. I made it all right until I heard a timber wolf howl. This stopped my home leaving. When the hunting season opened that fall, something happened that was <clears throat> almost more than I could stand. And I was lying in bed one night trying to figure out a way I could get some dogs. When I heard the deep baying of a coon hound, I got up and opened my window and it came again. The deep voice rang loud and clear in the frosty night. Now and then I could hear the hunter whooping to him. The hound hunted all night. He quit when the rooster started crowing at daybreak. The hunter and the hound weren't the only ones awake that night. I stayed up and listened to them until the last tones of the hound's voice died away in the daylight hours. That morning I was determined to have some hounds. I went to Mama again. This time I tried bribing, bribery. 
I told her if she'd get me a hunting dog, I'd save the money I earned from my furs and buy her a new dress and a box full of pretty hats. Well, that time I saw tears in her eyes, and it made me feel all empty inside, and I cried a little too. And by the time she was all through kissing me and talking to me, I was sure I didn't need any dogs at all. I couldn't stand to see Mama cry. And the next night I heard the hound again. I tried to cover my head with a pillow to shut out the sound. It was no use. His voice seemed to bore its way through the pillow and ring in my ears. I had to get up and again and go to the window, but I'm sure if that coon hunter had known that he was slowly killing a ten-year-old boy, he would have put a muzzle on his hound. Sleep was out of the question. Even on nights when I couldn't hear the hound, I couldn't sleep. I was afraid if I did, he would come and I would miss hearing him. And by the time hunting season was over, I was a nervous wreck. My eyes were red and bloodshot, and I had lost weight and was as thin as a beanpole. Mama checked me over, and she looked at my tongue and turned back one of my eyelids. If I didn't know better, I'd swear you weren't sleeping well, are you? My mama, I said, I go to bed, don't I? What does a boy go to bed for if he doesn't sleep? By the little wrinkles that had bunched up on her forehead, I could tell that Mama wasn't satisfied. Papa came in during one of those inspections, and Mama told him that she was worried about my health. Ah, oh, he said, there ain't nothing wrong with him. It's just because he's been cooped up all winter. A boy needs sunshine and exercise. He's almost 11 now, <laughs> and I'm going to let him help me in the fields this summer. And that will put the muscles back on him. I thought this was wonderful. I'd finally grown up to be a man, and I was going to help Papa with the farm. <laughs>